The Lord be with you. Welcome to worship on this Lord's Day. Know that you are welcome among us and most sincerely invited to participate uh, in, the, in the service of worship, wherever you may be. There's some things that I want to highlight today in terms of announcements. Uh, on the 25th, the last Sunday of, the, of this month, October, we will be celebrating Fall Fest that afternoon here at First Presbyterian Church in Worcester. And it's gonna be a drive-by, drive-by Fall Fest out in the parking lot, but we do need volunteers to help with uh, passing out goodies and, and welcoming folks and one thing and another. So if you uh, would see your way clear to volunteer on the afternoon of the 25th of October, uh, please call the church office or shoot us an email and we'll get you on the list. I also invite you to visit our website, firstpresworcester.org, Wor first because uh, two of our wonderful uh, members of the staff, Amy Backstrom, Director of Family Ministries, and Rachel King, our Director of Children's Music Ministries, uh, are, have load, up, uploaded many fun and uh, interesting uh, pages on our website. So you will be delighted and you will be engaged and you will be entertained. So I invite you to go there as well as uh, visit our own YouTube channel uh, as well. And finally, very happy during this worship service to welcome Claudia Thompson, a pianist who will join our own Eric Gasteyer uh, at the second piano for a two piano a music piece. Let us now prepare our hearts to worship God. Good morning. The service music today consists of three transcriptions, works that were originally composed for one instrument or group of instruments and have been arranged by another composer or arranger for a different instrument or set of instruments. For the prelude, the 19th century French master, César Franck, a piece that he originally wrote for the French harmonium, similar to our reed organ or parlor organ in this country, and 20th century master Louis Vierne arranged it for grand org, or for two manuals and pedal in this case. The postlude today is a transcription by J.S. Bach of a string concerto by Antonio Vivaldi. Bach arranged several of these, um, but despite his Germanic influence, they remain very much Italian pieces, as you will see. This piece is almost ideally suited to our particular instrument. You'll notice the main portion of the piece is played on the center manual, the pipework that resides in the very top of our organ case here near the ceiling, and the echo sections are played on the rook positive, or the chair organ, the smaller case that sits on our rail here, our gallery rail here at First Pres. For the musical offering today, I'm very happy to welcome back my friend and colleague, Claudia Thompson, who joins me at one of our two pianos. We're playing a two piano arrangement of an Antonin Dvorak Larghetto from his String Serenade in E major. Thank you.
I invite you to join me in our call to worship. The heavens are telling the glory of God. All creation proclaims God's handiwork. Each sunrise speaks of God's faithfulness, and the night reveals the Creator's awe. Without a word being spoken, all creation bears witness to the goodness and mystery of God. So too, may we join in witness with all creation. May the words of our mouths, the meditations of our hearts, and the work of our hands be God's signature in the world. Let us pray. You name us, O God, with grace we do not fully grasp, for you call us to love as we have been loved. You send us, O God, to persons and communities in need, for you call us to see and respond with compassion. In following your call, strengthen us to follow your example, embodied in the life and ministry of Jesus. Amen. Please pray with me our prayer of confession. O God, gladly we would live and move and have our being in you. Yet in the midst of such creation glory, we see sin's shadow and feel death's darkness. Around us in the earth, sea, and sky, the abuse of creation. Beside us in the broken, the hungry, and the poor, the betrayal of the other, and often deep within us, a striving against your spirit. O Trinity of love, forgive us that we may forgive one another. Heal us that we may, we may be people of healing, and renew us that we also may be makers of peace. As we worship you this day, may we rediscover our identity as defined by your love. Gracious God, hear our prayers. Amen. God does not abandon us in our fear. God comes to us, God journeys with us, and God can be trusted even when all seems lost. Friends, receive this good news. We are forgiven and restored. Be at peace with God and with one another. Amen. Please turn to others around you and offer a gesture of peace. The peace of Christ be with you. And also with you. And also with you. Also with you. May the peace of Christ be with you. Hi, everybody. I wanted to share with you some of my favorite things, some things that really give me joy. And one of those things is a warm, handmade quilt. This one was made by my grandmother with from my grandfather's uh, flannel shirts that he always wore and it's cozy and it's warm and when I wrap myself up around it I can feel their hugs a grandma's hug is another thing that gives me joy if you know me you know M&Ms give me joy and this is about as many M&Ms as you can get the sunshine brings me joy I love the sunshine and the warmth that it gives me Coffee brings me joy at any time of the day. Mandarin oranges bring me joy. Hugs from my family, hugs from you, seeing your smiles, our church family brings me joy. It reminds me of a scripture. Philippians 4, 4 says, rejoice in the Lord. Now we're all going to have that song in our head. Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. And you can start singing that with your family and have a nice round at the lunch table today. 
But Jesus says, rejoice in the Lord. Find what gives you joy so that you can rejoice, so that you can re-joy, like re-gift. Find something joyful in your life. A hug, a cozy blanket, a ray of sunshine, a nice walk in the park, a hug from your friends, maybe your family. Find something that gives you joy and rejoice in the Lord. And show that joy, re-joy, to somebody else. Share that joy with somebody else. Now, this blanket is so warm and cozy. It brings me joy and it makes me feel so good. And it makes me want to share my joy with somebody else. And in this time when we're still feeling a little, and we're missing things, and we're stressed out about things, and things just aren't going the way we thought they were going to, we need to find some joy. So find some joy. I'll even share my M&Ms with you. Find something that gives you joy in your life and rejoice in the Lord this week. Let's pray. Dear God, thank you for so giving us so many wonderful things to be joyful about and help us to rejoice in you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. At this time in our worship together, I invite you to join with me in prayer. And I offer this prayer of commitment to peace and global justice that was written by Gordon Schull, one of the members, longtime members of our congregation. And so we offer this prayer for peace and justice as we continue on this fall in the season of peace. Let us pray. God, all-powerful and all-knowing, encircle us. Keep love within and fear without. Keep peace within and violence out. Circle us with your presence. God, all-loving and all-embracing, encircle us. Keep wholeness in and disease without. Keep care within and selfishness out. Circle us with your love. God almighty and all caring, encircle us. Keep truth within and injustice out. Keep acceptance in and prejudice out. Circle us with your peace. God, may we be instruments of your peace today in a world divided by war and strife. May we be your reconcilers in a world of hurt and pain. May we be those who care for our enemies in a world that kills and maims May we be those who heal and restore. God, lead us with your peace through the pathway of your love to the promise of your kingdom. May your blessing, O God, be upon us. The blessing of the God of life, the blessing of the Christ of love, the blessing of of the spirit of peace, now and forevermore. And hear us as we join our voices in the ancient prayer which we have been taught, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
The Old Testament lesson for today comes from the book of Exodus, chapter, ver uh, chapter 20, verses 1 through 21. And this passage has an echo in the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 5, also verses 1 through 21, a bit more expanded version in Deuteronomy, if you will. But as uh, we will immediately hear, this is the story of the giving of the Ten Commandments. Then God spoke all these words. I am the Lord your God, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an idol, whether in the form of anything that is in heaven above or that is on the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or worship them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing children for the iniquity of parents to the third and fourth generation of those who reject me, but showing steadfast love to the thousandth generation of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not make wrongful use of the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not acquit anyone who misuses his name. Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. You shall not do any work. You, your son or your daughter, your male or female slave, your livestock, or the alien resident in your towns. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them, but rested the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and consecrated it. Honor your father and your mother, so that your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet, covet your neighbor's wife or male or female slave, or ox or donkey, or anything that belongs to your neighbor. When all the people witnessed the thunder and lightning, the sound of the trumpet, and the mountain smoking, they were afraid and trembled and stood at a distance and said to Moses, You speak to us, we will listen. But do not let God speak to us, or we will die. Moses said to the people, Do not be afraid, for God has come only to test you and to put the fear of him upon you so that you do not sin. Then the people stood at a distance while Moses drew near to the thick darkness where God was. With a uh, hot election nearly on our doorsteps, I expect the Ten Commandments to be raised as a political platform and advertising tool in certain regions of our body politic. These well-worn words have often become weapons in the religious and political battles for America. My 14 years serving a church in Alabama certainly etched that impression upon me. These biblical injunctions often came down to who could wield the two stone tablets to greater effect. In Alabama, even a Supreme Court Chief Justice, Roy Moore, had to be removed for displaying a granite monument featuring the Ten Commandments in the state courthouse. 
But despite the politicized emphasis on these commandments in the Bible, Christians and Jews hardly have a corner on the commandment market. A search of ancient Middle Eastern cultures turns up law lists that echo the Mosaic commandments from even earlier times. Sumerian and Akkadian texts that date from 3000 to 2000 BCE, Babylonian laws from the second millennium BCE, including the Code of Hammurabi, ancient Egyptian law codes, laws from the Kassites, the Hittites, the Assyrians, the Phoenicians. There are equally ancient examples from India and China, the ancient Eightfold Path Toward Buddhist Enlightenment includes these five principles of right conduct. Do not kill, do not steal, do not lie, do not be unchaste, do not drink intoxicants. Today, our conflicts with nations where Islam is the predominant religion are to some extent conflicts with interpretations of commandments that come from the Quran. The current tendency to, in our own culture, to misunderstand or misuse the Ten Commandments may come from forgetting or not considering what lies behind these commands. When I come across roadside billboards with these words emblazoned on them, what part of thou shalt not do you not understand, signed God, then I know the message of the Ten Commandments has been missed. These Ten Commandments have indeed come down to us as a list of the thou shalt nots, do not do those things, and presumably all will be well, or at least God will not smite us. But the stories of the Bible demonstrate that not doing something is not enough. When the young man with many possessions came to Jesus in the Gospel according to Matthew, chapter 19, to ask about gaining eternal life, Jesus quoted some of the Ten Commandments. But he also added, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. When perfecting that love meant selling his possessions and giving to the poor, the young man went away grieving. It had been so much easier for him to not do things than to do the one great thing, love and care for his neighbor as himself. I suspect most all religions have a strong urge in them to focus on the thou shalt nots. That is how to keep people in line. That is how to measure one's devotion and purity. And that is how to exclude people, to judge people, to ultimately get around Jesus' injunction to love my neighbor as myself. I suspect that posting the thou shalt nots in public places is a convenient and easy substitute for some of Jesus' more difficult thou shalls, such as love your enemies or give to someone who asks. But to reduce the Ten Commandments to the Ten Prohibitions, the Ten Thou Shalt Nots, is to miss the point. In Hebrew, these are the Ten words, the ten words that shape a new life for a people who came out of Egyptian bondage. 
No longer will people be enslaved. No longer will the people be subject to the desires and designs of the state, the life-diminishing structures of Pharaoh, where those on top stay on top and those at the bottom suffer. Instead, the people are invited into the wilderness where economic and social distinctions cannot exist. And more importantly, the people are invited into a covenant relationship with God where there is life for today and hope for tomorrow. The ten words of this covenant are not just commandments, not simply prohibitions. The ten words are promises, promises of the way life will be. And these promises are no competing gods, no idols, God's name forever honored, rest for creation, family stability, life, faithfulness, generosity, truthfulness, and contentment. Far from a world bound by thou shalt nots, this God of the Exodus is calling us into relationship formed by loving God and loving neighbor as oneself. To be honest, it is easier to keep a list of rules, easier to obey the prohibitions. But God would give us life, abundant life, life that comes by risking reconciliation, restoration, renewal. Or to use some of the ten words, rest faithfulness, generosity, truthfulness, contentment. In this season, this season of peacemaking, we join peoples from across the globe, those with whom we have something in common and those who are decidedly different, those with whom we agree and those with whom we are in deep conflict, those who are easy to love, and those who are not. We come to worship because we are called by something beyond ourselves. We come here to find what the ten words describe. Shalom, peace, healing and wholeness for the whole world. The way into this shalom is not always clear. Like Moses, we must be willing to draw near to the thick darkness that surrounds the mystery of God. We do that not by following ten rules, but by practicing God's love, generosity, truthfulness, faithfulness, sacrifice for God and for neighbor. Today, may we rededicate ourselves to this practice of God's love by joining our sisters and brothers, our fellow children of God, in practices that embody God's love for us and for all. Amen. When we read some of these passages in the Old Testament, such as the passage today from Exodus 20, and the writer or writers describe God as a jealous God, punishing iniquity into the third and fourth generation. 
And there are plenty of other passages that depict a vengeful God. Um, It's hard for us not to have that be our vision. But what we see embodied in the life of Jesus and in the message that Jesus brings about God is that God is indeed full of grace, full of loving kindness, merciful, full of joy. And that is the image that we must keep foremost in our lives of faith. The image of God wooing the world to healing and wholeness. Difficult to imagine in times such as these, raging pandemic, explosive uh, racial tensions resulting from uh, hundreds of years of white dominance and supremacy over our brothers and sisters of color. As we look around the world and see um, natural disasters and conflicts between peoples, it's, it's hard to hold on to the idea that we worship and we follow a God of hope. So we remind each other. We buck each other up. We pray for one another. And most importantly, we work to embody that hope in all that we say and do. May it be so for you and for me. And as you leave worship this day, go knowing that you are embraced in the steadfast love of God forever, that you are redeemed in the grace of Jesus Christ now and always, that together we are being empowered by Holy Spirit for faithful witness and loving service this and every day of our lives. And so, may God's hope, peace, joy, love abide with you and with us all. Amen.